Well, it's no secret that Donald Trump's presidency is often defined by his own personal inferiority complex when it comes to the accomplishments of his predecessors. It was still a shock to the system to learn that he planned to host the terrorist group that supported the horrific September 11th attacks the weekend before the anniversary of September 11th, a plan that was scuttled, according to the president, because the terrorist group in question carried out a terrorist attack. From the New York Times report on how the planned weekend at Camp David with the terrorist organization came to be, quote, on the Friday before Labor Day, President Trump gathered top advisors in the sit room to consider what could be done, what could be among the profound decisions of his presidency, a peace plan with the Taliban after 18 years of grinding bloody war in Afghanistan. The Times goes on to describe a rare divide between Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and National Security Advisor John Bolton. Bolton warning against quote, getting in bed with killers swathed in American blood, according to that Times report. But Bolton ultimately would not prevail with Donald J. Trump. The Times goes on to report that the president became intrigued by the spectacle of producing an event in Washington and landed on Camp David as the place to host his made-for-TV moment. The Times adds this, quote, the leaders of a rugged militant organization deemed terrorists by the U.S., would be hosted in the mountain getaway used for presidents, prime ministers, and kings just three days before the anniversary of the September 11, 2001 attacks. The meeting was canceled by, how else? A presidential tweet. But that hasn't stopped the president from lashing out at critics of the planned talks, some from within his own party. A terrorist organization that doesn't recognize nation states, that kills innocent women and children, that denies women the right to really even be in the same room as their husbands is just a minor part of the terrible things that they do. To have them at Camp David uh, is totally unacceptable. And as we head into the into the anniversary of 9-11, I do not ever want to see these terrorists step foot on in on United States soil, period. And just in the last hour, President Trump defending the diplomatic chaos, claiming credit for ending the talks that he pushed to hold at Camp David. In terms of advisors, I took my own advice. I like the idea of meeting. I've met with a lot of bad people and a lot of good people during the course of the last almost three years. And I think meeting is a great thing. I think that meeting with, you know, you're talking about war. There are meetings with war. Otherwise, wars would never end. You'd have them go on forever. Uh, we had a meeting scheduled. Uh, it was my idea, and it was my idea to terminate it. I didn't even, I didn't discuss it with anybody else. When I heard, very simply, that they killed one of our soldiers and 12 other innocent people, I said, there's no way I'm meeting on that basis. There's no way I'm meeting. I didn't discuss it with anyone else. That's reassuring. And for those asking, how could this happen in the first place? Well, take a look at Donald Trump's past comments about what 9-11 meant to him, and it might become clearer. Many of those affected were firefighters, police officers, and other first responders. And I was down there also. But I'm not considering myself a first responder. But I was down there. I spent a lot of time down there with you. I watched when the World Trade Center came tumbling down. And I watched in Jersey City, New Jersey, where thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. Thousands of people were cheering. So something's going on. We got to find out what it is. 40 Wall Street actually was the second tallest building in downtown Manhattan. And, and it was actually before the World Trade Center was the tallest. And then when they built the World Trade Center, it became known as the second tallest, and now it's the tallest. So in order there, Donald Trump, not a first responder, an outright lie, and a boast about his real estate. That's how the president has spoken out publicly about September 11th. And that is where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. With us from Washington, White House reporter for the New York Times, whose byline is on the aforementioned and heavily quoted New York Times report, Michael Crowley. Elise Labatt is a journalist in residence at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. She joins us again at the table. Former Republican Congressman, now an independent, David Jolly, and NBC and MSNBC national affairs analyst, John Heilman. Michael Crowley, 
Kelly, I want to read some more from your um, superb reporting um, um, in, in how this all came to be and then not be, and then have you take us, take us through it. Um, you write, on display were all the characteristic traits of the Trump presidency, the yearning ambition for the grand prize, the endless quest to achieve what no other president has achieved, the willingness to defy convention, the volatile mood swings, and the tribal infighting. My question when I got to that was tribal infighting, was that in Afghanistan or inside his cabinet? What was the reference? <laughs> well, yeah, no, believe it or not, in this case, we're talking about the president's cabinet. I uh, want to, at the front, make sure I give due credit to my colleagues P Peter Baker and Mujib Mishal, who are amazing, and uh, uh, we're also bylines on that story, group effort. Uh, but yes, um, there are tribal factions, you might say, in this White House, and in particular, this episode has shined a spotlight on these conflicting impulses, both within the president's own mind uh, and uh, top levels of his national security team namely his national security advisor, John Bolton, in particular, uh, and in this case, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, who was trying to uh, make these talks happen, and now uh, they are kind of shattered on the floor, and who knows what comes next. What was Mike, what's Mike Pompeo's best argument for pushing so hard for meeting um, with terrorists? And I'm sure there's a lengthy reel of tape of him as a congressman um, saying things that would make it really surprising to read what you and your colleagues reported, that he was the one yeah. pushing on behalf of um, Zal for the toxic ed in Washington with the president. Yeah, you know, uh, somebody put it to me today that, you know, Bolton, this is, gets painted sometimes as a little bit of hawk versus dove, Bolton and Pompeo. Bolton is definitely a hawk. Um, Pompeo is no dove. He's actually pretty hawkish himself. But what he's trying to do, uh, you know, charitably put, is to implement the president's agenda. His critics would say that he's just trying to please the president no matter what, in part because of his own future political ambitions. But what the president has made clear is he thinks that Afghanistan is basically a boondoggle and and a quagmire, and he wants to get out. And he also has a political motive to brag to voters over the next year, I'm ending this war that no one else could wrap up in 18 years. So Pompeo was given the mission of figuring out a way to do that. So uh, he launched through his special envoy to Afghanistan, Zalmay Khalilzad, uh, these talks with the Taliban that have been happening for nine months, which you know a lot of uh, people who know much more about Afghanistan than I do say that is the way this thing has to end. Neither side can win militarily. You have have to do it through talks. Um, but what's interesting here is that, you know, the, a contrary view that I think John Bolton was expressing was, actually, you don't. You could just pull out. Why get in bed with the Taliban? Uh, <coughs> you know, just say you're leaving. And so that's the tension you're seeing right now. But that's why uh, Trump and Pompeo uh, launched this diplomatic effort. Elise, let me read you a little bit more from the Times. Um, excellent reporting on this. Uh, they also write, what would have been one of the biggest headline-grabbing moments of his tenure was put together on the spur of the moment, then canceled on the spur of the moment. The usual national security process was dispensed with. Only a small circle of advisors was even clued in. Um, your thoughts? Well, some excellent reporting there by Michael and his team. Um, but it's it's true. Look, there have been talks about meeting with the Taliban. You remember last month there was this meeting in Bedminster, um, and it was first raised then. Um, and the president kind of saw this deal shaping up. He was getting pressure from Bolton, from uh, congressmen like Lindsey Graham, other supporters that said this this deal is really putting too much trust in the Taliban. And the president was getting frustrated. And he said, listen, I don't really like this deal shaping up, but I also don't want to walk away. So he's looking for a third way and thought, hey, I talked to Kim Jong-un. I talked to Vladimir Putin. I talked to, you know, President Xi and I negotiate with them. I can, you know, do this better. And then the, I don't know who the genius was that came up with the 9-11 uh, kind of, uh, uh, date, the date so close to 9-11, but clearly the president was thinking he could get in the room. And this is the problem. I mean, as we've all said, a lot of people think that you're going to need to uh, talk, try and come to some accommodation. You don't talk with your friends. You talk with your enemies. But the way this was done, it was done without, you know, kind of a process. Even Zal's team didn't even really know. They were caught flat-footed. Um, and this over-reliance on the pageantry and the president's own desire to get in the room, I think, is part is, you know, a lot of the problem. And also the idea that he'd be conferring this legitimacy on the Taliban instead of on the Afghan government to strengthen their hand with talks. I mean, just the whole idea, this was not a real pre-cooked 
uh, way to have a negotiation. It, it just the deal wasn't ready for this to happen. I mean, John, uh, just to take Elise's three examples and inside Trump's mind, he thinks I talked. about election meddling uh, is widely viewed to be destabilizing the global economy over its launch in a way. So, I, I mean, I, I, I trust her on how Trump came to believe that only he could negotiate peace with the Taliban, but he's 0 for 3 on big swings in foreign policy. Yeah, and, you know, as we know, the supposed Middle East peace deal that is, you know, everywhere else, very hard, to, very hard to get done, but we're going to get it done like that, uh, not happening. There's, I think, you know, we're almost now three years in, and the Trump foreign policy has been, I think, by just, you don't have to be a wild-eyed partisan to sort of say what, what has occurred, other than the destruction of Barack Obama's legacy, other than withdrawing from the climate accords, shutting down the Iran deal. What's the positive legacy of the Trump foreign policy uh, so far? I think the answer is zero. Um, and I think the so most... So bad that Mattis left over your Syria policy. Right. And, and, and here's the most interesting part of the time story to me, which goes to the whole thing, toward the end, where it says, little was Matt, you know, they talked about how the thing got canceled. Only then came Mr. Trump's tweets on Saturday night disclosing that he had invited the Taliban and Mr. Ghani to Camp David, but called it off, citing the bombing. The tweets took many in the administration by surprise. There was no reason for Mr. Trump to reveal what had happened, several officials said, especially since he was not given up on the idea of a negotiated settlement. So why? All this is happening in secret. Many presidents conduct diplomacy of high stakes in secret. The president revealed it, even though apparently for no good reason. What he wants is credit. He for wants what? credit for trying. I'm not saying he deserves credit. I'm saying there's some impulse that he has where he thinks that taking on, trying to do something like that, because he believes he's the only one he can do it, somehow the notion that he was going to get them over there, that he was going to do, he didn't get a deal done. We didn't even have a meeting. But having even tried to do something no one else has done before. That's all that matters in his yeah. mind is, has anyone done it before? If they haven't done it before, I'm going to try to do it, and ideally I will do it, but if I don't do it, I'll take credit for trying to do something no one else has done before. It's the most infantile, truly infantile, like infantile approach to a foreign policy of you know, anybody I, we've ever covered or ever seen in our lifetime. And, and I think the frame is dangerous because it, it, it ushers in a lowering of the bar where there are actually serious people having serious conversations about whether it makes sense to talk to the Taliban or not. This to Donald Trump was information delivered on the same transom as tweets about individual reporters who wrote stories about his squandered summer, right. something he's right. privately mused about. It, you know, it, it comes out and I mean, there's a flattening with Donald Trump. And, and, and I think that even, I agree with your analysis, but I think even legitimizing the idea that to him this was meaningful. You know what other presidents did the Sunday before 9-11? Yeah. So the Sunday before 9-11, well, first of all, Barack Obama before 9-11 <laughs> killed bin Laden. That's right. So there's that. Right. But other normal presidents, do you know what they did on the Sunday before 9-11? Let's see. Obama proclaimed uh, uh, the National Days of Prayer and Remembrance. George W. Bush visited Ground Zero the Sunday before 9-11. I mean, normal presidents certainly focus on what happened with the Taliban, but not to invite them to Camp That's David right. for Diet Cokes. This was not a president trying to end the war in Afghanistan. This was a president reaching for a headline. And when he failed to accomplish it, as the reporting shows, he had to create it himself. There was no reason for him to acknowledge to the world these conversations were going on. And the other bit of surprise in his tweets is that he seemed to be taken aback that the Taliban was actually a bad actor, that somehow the Taliban was behind the latest act of terror surprised him because he was going to bring them to Camp David and they were going to negotiate. <clears throat> We often see this president, when he is reaching for a legacy, he simply demonstrates his own idiocy. He demonstrates a lack of respect and understanding of the national fabric. We're reporting on how this almost happened. We're talking about the decision making, which was absurd and unconventional. But Nicole, imagine if this had happened, mm. that the week of 9-11, Donald Trump would have been standing not just on American soil, but in a sacrosanct space like Camp David, next to the leader of the Taliban. The surviving families of those who lost their lives at Ground Zero mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania, the surviving families of those who lost their lives on the battlefields of Afghanistan, Iraq, other related forward deployed locations. Think about the signal Donald Trump would be sending 
to those surviving mm -hmm. families in the nation to stand shoulder to shoulder with the leader of the Taliban mm. on American soil the week of 9-11. It is an atrocious and frankly garbage moment from this president. And I said earlier, I, I, I try to choose my words carefully, but it is episodes like this that cause a lot of people to simply say, this is a bad guy. He's just a bad guy. He's looking out for his own legacy in some perverted way that he thinks actually satisfies long-term respect by striking this deal. While he's trampling on the legacy of those who lost their lives, we were attacked on 9-11. This is right. different than past negotiations, mm -hmm. past wars. Our soil was attacked. But it's worse than that. It's and just, he was going to stand with the enemy. You said the right, the thing. You said the right thing, though. You put it better than I did, which is that it's not that he's going for legacy. He's going for the cheap headline. Because yes, when the yeah. legacy is out of re out of reach, the le supposed legacy-making yeah. move, when that goes away, he goes, he's like, well, i got to get the headline anyway. It's it doesn't totally matter whether it's a good headline, yeah. a bad headline, a headline is going to get curled. I just got to get some attention for me. Well, and, and that's and all it is. Michael Crowley, that's what's so remarkable about sort of the, the, the pulling back of the timeline. You, you start with the Friday before Labor Day and even even the way you've reported out these conversations in the sit room and I understand there weren't political or communications folks in the room who might have alerted everybody I'm not sure Pompeo and Bolton need to be alerted that the date would fall right before 9-11 but but what's remarkable is that it would sound like and I'd love your thoughts that this is the case because this is what comes through it would sound like even national security conversations and appeals are now presented to the president in terms of how they would project out outwardly on the world stage and domestically. Is that, is that an accurate read of what you guys report? Well, I think, yeah, I don't think the, I think the president doesn't, isn't interested in other people's opinions about how things are going to play. He has his own, uh, he has his own paradigms of how things play. And in fact, you know, I, this is a little bit in the realm of speculation, but what would you get from this meeting? I mean, we're saying headlines, yes, but there's something a little more. It's the sort of holy bleep factor mm -hmm. of it, right? Which reminds me so much of this decision he took to go meet with Kim Jong-un, yeah. who, you know, now we see per per perhaps slightly differently, but remember, uh, and, and that's a complicated question we can return to, but remember how we thought about Kim Jong-un before he ever came out and met Trump. I mean, it was murderous dictator, killed members of his own family, you know, uh, dispatched assassins with a uh, nerve agent into a major airport to kill his half brother. Now it's sort of this, you know, slightly goofy guy who waddles across the border no, but, with but, Trump but to, at the DMZ. And to they your have this, point, and, but to your, to that's your the po holy bleep factor. He loves that. But to your point, I mean, I was thinking as, as David was talking about Otto Warmbier's parents, who when he did some of yeah. those holy bleep factor, I mean, because I think David's point is right. The, 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 <clears throat> the audience, the, kind of the, the first group of people that a normal administration takes in con into consideration are the people who are actual direct victims of a murderous dictator, which Kim Jong-un is. And you think about how Otto Warmbier's family has almost been re-traumatized every time the holy bleep factor has been rolled out on behalf of this president's image making. Yeah, and yet, you know, somehow w the president does these things, they completely horrify huge numbers of people, and he just always hangs around at about 43%. And he's got some theory of the case, and it will be put to the test in 14 months. Uh, you know, does commanding these headlines and s making everybody freak out and say, oh my God, he can't do that. Yes, he just did that over and over and over again. He seems to think that's going to be the path to victory. And then He's going to have just enough, you know, 43, 45 percent. What did he get in in uh, in 2016? It was like it was, you know, for, uh, you know, 45 percent plus or minus a little bit got him uh, elected president. And he thinks he can do it again. So, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people would have been really shocked by the appearance of the Taliban at Camp David. But the president, to back to the original question, the optics, how does it look? He just has his own theory of the case. And it just doesn't uh, it's just comes from a completely different direction than we've ever been used to. Elise, I want to give you a two-part question and the last word on this. I agree with everything Michael Crowley said, and, and, and his reporting is, is, is tremendous here. But the truth is, Donald Trump cares 100 percent how it looks in the mainstream media. There is no other mirror. So he may do these things um, sort of marching to his own beat, but the only reviews he cares about are the ones from Michael Crowley and his colleagues and, and, and other folks in the media. And, and on that, this was not going to be a winner. There were going to be the kinds of folks that David Jolly talked about who were horrified.
to see terrorists, including, from my understanding, some in his own administration. And then the second, I'd like you to end with some substance. I mean, what is the substantive effect of having a terrorist organization at Camp David? Do other terrorist organizations think, hey, so I want to come and I want the Camp David package? I mean, what do we, what do we unleash? What do we unfurl with a move like this being on the table from an American president? Well, I mean, on the first part of your question, I think that he thinks, you know, I think he thinks maybe this is going to help him in the negotiation. Um, and that, you know, reflects a real fundamental misunderstanding of both the Taliban and Afghanistan. These are not people to negotiate with. They're not, you know, he has a beautiful relationship with Kim Jong-un and now he's Chairman King. I mean, I don't know that, you know, he's going to be bosom buddies with the Taliban now. This is not um, the same thing. And I don't think you can really apply it. These are people that you're trying to negotiate an end to, you know, withdrawal uh, of U.S. forces. There's not going to be peace. There's not going to be some warm, loving relationship. And I think if he thinks this kind of raises his standing, I think he's going to be mistaken. I mean, right now, um, estimates of the Taliban, you know, holding about 60 percent of the country, they have been hit a lot in the last few weeks. I think, you know, the Taliban would like to negotiate some end, but if there's not going to be a peace. There's not going to be a peace for Afghanistan. Um, you know, in the last couple of days, Pompeo went on all the talk shows and said, you know, you bring a lot of bad people to Camp David. I was thinking back. I mean, I've been covering foreign policy for close to 20 years, and I, and I can't really think of that many bad people um, that have been at Camp David. And to kind of confer the legitimacy, as we've been saying, on the Taliban to bring them to Camp David, um, I think it sends, sends a really bad message. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.